So um, I'm very pleased to present uh, Professor Gabriel, Gabriel Finder, who is a professor in the Department of Germanic Languages and Literatures at the University of, University of Virginia in Charlottesville and an affiliate faculty member in the University's Jewish Studies Program. He's currently developing a research project on Jews in communist China. Um, Professor Finder's recent books are Laughter After, Humor and the Holocaust, uh, Justice Beyond, Behind the Iron Curtain, Nazis on Trial in Communist Poland. Uh, and he's also writing currently, uh, Honor Court Jews in Poland Look Inward After the Holocaust uh, for uh, Wayne State University Press. Um, and there's a bunch of other publications here. Um, but um, uh, his uh, contribution to our program today originates in his book chapter, The Place of Child Survivors in Polish Jewish Collective Memory After the Holocaust, The Case of Unzura Kinder uh, in, and this is in the book, Displaced Children in Russia and Eastern Europe, uh, 1915 to 1953. Um, so uh, I'm, Professor Finder has spoken a number of a number of times for us here at the museum, and uh, I also wanted to say he just informed me today that he is just retired last week from the University of Virginia. However, uh, he assures me that he is going to continue working on his research projects and continue teaching, and um, and I hope that includes also speaking to us here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. So. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome Professor Finder. Let me just tell you what the schedule is going to be again. So Professor Finder will speak for a few minutes um, and then we're gonna watch the movie, uh, Unser Kinder. The link is in your schedule. And I also put the link here in the chat so you should be able to get it either way. Uh, and then after the movie, uh, the movie is 68 minutes long. So about 70 minutes after we start, we're gonna get back together and we're going to hear from Professor Finder and from another guest. And after that, we'll do some closing remarks. So without further ado, I hand the virtual microphone over to Professor Finder. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Yes, good. So I wanna thank uh, my friend, Paul Redensky for inviting me to participate in this year's stage summer seminar. This is my third, I believe, stage seminar and I've always found them immensely rewarding. Uh, I was previously in New York City at the museum and I look forward to the time when I can visit the museum in New York again. I will introduce the film Unsere Kinder. We'll watch it. And after the screening of the film, the floor will be open to discussion. But before discussion, we'll hear a few words from my dear mentor, colleague and friend, Shimon Redlich, Emeritus Professor of Eastern European Jewish History at Ben-Gurion University in Israel who is joining us today from Modi'in in Israel. Why did I ask Shimon Redlich to join us? Because the adolescent Shimon Redlich, himself a child survivor of the Holocaust who survived in hiding with his family in Eastern Poland, now Western Ukraine, has a leading role in the film Unsere Kinder. I've always wanted to meet a movie star and now I've known one for about 20 years, and here's your chance to meet a movie star. Let me begin. I know that many of you speak Yiddish, so I'm going to begin with uh, a sentence in Yiddish. Unsere Kinder, unsere Kinder, wie viel Inhalt liegt ot in die zwei poschete Werte? Our children, our children, how much meaning lies in these two simple words? These words come from the voiceover in the opening scene of the Polish Jewish feature film, Unsere Kinder, Our Children. Unsere Kinder, filmed in 1948 and its editing completed in 1949, was the last Yiddish language feature film produced in Poland. It was directed by Natan Gross, who survived the Holocaust in hiding in Poland. After he left Poland in 1950, he became a film director in Israel, where he died in 2006. The film's stars are the Yiddish comedic duo Shimon Gigan, who was born in 1905 and died in 1980, and Yisrael Schumacher, who was born in 1908 and died in 1961. The comedians returned to Poland from the USSR in 1947 after spending the war years mostly in Soviet prisons and labor camps. 
Gigan and Schumacher have been household names in pre-war Poland. After the return to Poland, they played to full houses of Jewish audiences in need of a little comic relief. In the film, Unsere Kinder, Gigan and Schumacher essentially play themselves, entertainers who, arriving in Poland after years spent in the Soviet Union, are, are perplexed and thrown off balance when they realize how much of the old Jewish way of life which have been the source of their act before the war has been destroyed. Besides Gigan and Schumacher, only a handful of professional actors appear in Unsere Kinder. They include, for example, Nusha Gold, who plays the director of the children's home that is the film's epicenter. But the film's real stars are the children who appear in it. They are Jewish children who survived the Holocaust. Some, like Shimon Redlich, survived in hiding. Many others survived in Soviet Asia. The casting of actual child survivors seems to have appealed to Gigan and Schumacher, who, was in, who were inspired after paying a visit to the Jewish children's home in Helenovic, a village on the outskirts of Lodz, shortly after the return to Poland from the USSR. Owing to the decisions to have both the comedian and these children essentially play themselves, the film blurs the lines between fact and fiction. For this reason, many people have mistaken it for a documentary. It is not a documentary, it's a feature film. In this vein, however, I should add a caveat. At the heart of the film are three flashbacks. Look for the adolescent Shimon Redlich in the second flashback. All three flashbacks have some relationship to reality, to documented events, but in a loose way. In my view, and I've argued this in my publications, the flashbacks represent the poetic license or author's prerogative of Nathan Gross and the film's screenwriters in the service of their larger ideological objective, which was to construct a positive, and pragmatic post-Holocaust Jewish identity for the surviving communities in Poland and elsewhere. And this ideological objective is refracted through the prism of Jewish children who, against all odds, survived the Holocaust. By the way, I should say, as you can tell already, there are a lot of overlap. I, would, uh, we I think that my talk will complement the Natalia Alexion's talk this morning quite well. This leads me to say a few words about Jewish children during and after the Holocaust. The Jewish population on the eve of the Second World War numbered about three and a half million, including close to one million children up to the age of 14. Only a remnant of this largest Jewish community in Europe survived the Holocaust. The total number of Polish Jewish survivors probably never exceeded 350 to 400,000 people. That is out of three and a half million. Of these, roughly 220,000 to 250,000 Jews resurfaced in or returned to Poland after the war. There were very few children among the survivors. According to data compiled by the Central Committee of Polish Jews, the official representative body of Polish post-war Polish Jewry until 1950, some 28,000 Jewish children remained alive after the Holocaust. Of these, 5,000 children survived on Polish soil, for the most part hidden either by Christian families or in convents and monasteries, while a small proportion had been liberated from labor or concentration camps or had found refuge in the company of partisans. The majority of surviving Jewish children returned to Poland with Jews repatriated from the USSR in 1946. In statistical terms, only 3% of Polish Jewish children survived. By contrast, 11% of all European Jewish children remained alive after the war and the Holocaust. This percentage varied from country to country. By mid-1946, the Central Committee of Polish Jews, which encouraged the reconstruction of Jewish life in post-war Poland, had created a network of 12 children's homes throughout Poland for surviving children. 
Of the 5,000 Jewish children who survived in Poland and were registered by the Central Committee of Polish Jews, 1,000 became residents of these children's homes. About 600 of these institutionalized minors were orphans, and 300 had either a father or a mother, while only 100 still had both parents. After the repatriation of Polish Jews from the Soviet Union, the Central Committee of Polish Jews established 54 additional daytime hostels for some 3,800 3, children. Zionists in Poland established their own children's homes, which they called kibbutzim. The number of child survivors in Zionist homes reached its peak in the summer of 1946, when about 3,300 children resided in 50 kibbutzim located throughout the country. All told, about 8,000 or more than a quarter of Jewish children who reemerged in Poland after the Holocaust or returned to Poland spent time in a Jewish children's home or hostel in the immediate post-war period. In this post-war environment, Jewish children's homes and hostels played a decisive role in the physical and emotional rehabilitation of vast numbers of surviving children. In fact, many Jewish adults in Poland in the immediate post-war period were acutely aware of and concerned about the children's psychological problems as a result of the Holocaust. Jewish physicians, psychologists, educators, and social workers realized that while there were Jewish children who surfaced from their ordeal and good mental as well as physical health, or who recovered with relative ease, a significant number of them emerged from hiding in camps, not only in poor physical condition, but also emotionally scarred and with significant adjustment problems. At a conference of heads of Jewish children's homes that was held under the patronage of the Central Committee of Polish Jews in December 1947, the participants, and I quote now from uh, my good friend and historian, Joanna Michlitz, the participants, this is a quotation from one of her articles. The participants spoke about various difficulties they were encountering in instilling notions of happiness, assertiveness, and security, owing to the terrible emotional and physical injuries that the children had suffered in the war. One of the speakers reported that she came across children who were not familiar with human bonding, who had no recollections of being cuddled or kissed by their parents, and who in fact did not know what kissing meant. And end of quote. And I have to say this now as a parent, and I know that most of you are probably parents. When I read this for the first time so many years ago, I cannot get that image out of my mind. I love to kiss my children. And you know, you had children who did not, after the Holocaust, who did not know what kissing meant. I find that extremely tragic. The Children Accuse, a book published in Polish in 1947, is a collection of testimonies collected from children by the Polish Jewish Historical Commission after the Holocaust. Many of the testimonies gathered by the Jewish Historical Commission reflect surviving children's anxieties. These included the fear of death, longing for their lost parents, especially their mothers, envy of non-Jewish children who had not shared their experiences, strong desires for revenge, and feelings of guilt and even of a bad conscience because they had survived while other members of their families, including younger siblings for whom they felt responsible, had perished. Some children even expressed suicidal thoughts. Moreover, and Natalia Alexian discussed this this morning. Moreover, many Jewish child survivors, after spending several years hidden by Christians, preferred the Christian identity of their Polish rescuers to their own ambiguous or unstable Jewish identity and regarded fellow Jews with ambivalence, not to mention hostility in many cases. As a result, one self appointed task of Jewish children's homes in Poland was to help surviving children shed their negative perceptions of Jews and Judaism and regain a positive Jewish identity. After the war, 
individual relatives, representatives of the Central Committee of Polish Jews, and members of the Coordination for the Redemption of Jewish Children, a Zionist group, went to great lengths to find and retrieve Jewish children from Christian rescuers. Describing Jewish efforts to reclaim surviving Jewish children in general, historian Tara Zara writes, I quote, Jewish activists, both Zionist and non-Zionist, demanded the return of hidden children in the name of justice and to memorialize the dead, but also as a way to ensure the continuity of the community in the aftermath of the Holocaust, end of quote. Or, as my dear friend Shimon Redlich writes in one of his books, I quote, child survivors were considered to be walking miracles. They were everybody's children. That's why the film is called Our Children, Unsere Kinder, Our Children. Redley's recollection of the survivors' embrace of Jewish children illustrates the argument that after the Second World War, as Natalia Alexian said this morning, Jewish children were regarded by Jewish adults as valuable national property or assets to be reclaimed. Why the symbolic importance of Jewish children to the survivor community in Poland? In the first place, the Jewish child ranked high, if not highest, in the community's hierarchy of victims of the Nazi genocide. Emphasis on the suffering, let alone wanton murder of Jewish children, served to underpin the survivors' attempts to raise public consciousness throughout the world of the unprecedented and unsurpassed scale, violence, and moral depravity of the Nazis' anti-Jewish murder program. Moreover, the very presence of Jewish children functioned to support the assertion that the Jewish people, though devastated by the Nazi genocide, had survived and still had a future, be it in Poland or for the Zionists in Israel. In Poland in particular, given the near elimination of the Jewish community, Jews who planned to remain in the country regarded Jewish children on the, as the cohort on which Polish Jewry after the Holocaust must rely if it stood any chance of rebirth. Now to the film's plot. Unsere Kinder dramatizes the encounter between the Jewish comedians returning to Poland from the Soviet Union and surviving Jewish children of the Holocaust. A group of young Jewish residents of a children's homes on the outskirts of an unnamed town, in fact, Lodge, escorted by the institution's director, attend a matinee starring the comedians G. Gan and Schumacher. When the entertainers perform an unrealistic and sentimental musical skit, of two Jews begging for delicacies in the streets of a ghetto, one of the children whistles in disapproval from the balcony, disrupting the performance. After the show, the children, prompted by the home's director, apologize backstage. When the entertainers ask the children why they disrupted the ghetto skit, the main culprit answers, I quote, because it wasn't like that, end of quote. When the performers then ask whether the children know how it really was, Two girls in the group respond by spontaneously reenacting how they begged in the streets of the ghetto for a stickelbreit, a slice of bread. Now charmed by the children, eager to, glean, uh, sorry, eager to glean usable material from them for their act, the entertainers accept the director's invitation to visit the children's home, the actual Helenuvik. There they entertain the children with a virtuoso skit based on Sholem Aleichem's humorous story, Kas Rilevke Brent. Kasrilika is burning, which a fictional Jewish small town or shtetl burns to the ground owing to the ineptitude of its traditional Jewish inhabitants to put the fire out. The children laugh and applaud, seemingly unperturbed by the depiction on the makeshift stage of a devastating urban fire. After the performance, the entertainers ask the children whether anyone among them has ever seen a real fire the response is overwhelming. After a couple of children describe having witnessed the fire set by Germans in the Warsaw Ghetto, the comedians establish a competition among the children for the most gripping account of what they witnessed during the war years. Thereupon, the director brings the discussion, which is running into the children's bedtime, to an abrupt end with the words, I quote, now children, don't think about anything and go to bed, end of quote. 
But instead of falling asleep, the children talk late into the night in their dormitory, their memory stimulated by the entertainer's performance and their digging for material. Climbing the stairs to their room in the dark, Jigan and Schumacher peek into the children's dormitory bedrooms and overhear three children recalling for the others how they survived, their memories reenacted in visual flashbacks. As film historian Annette Insdors notes, and I love this, um, this um, what she says here, as uh, Annette Insdors notes, the comedians learn more from the children than they bargained for, end of quote. First, the comedians overhear one little girl telling the others how she was saved when a truck transporting children from the ghetto stops in a Polish village for repairs. When a German soldier taunts Polish peasants to purchase, I quote, a filthy Jewish child, end of quote, one elderly man, Polish man, produces money out of his pocket. Snatching the money from his hand, the German throws the girl out of the truck, which then resumes its journey to what viewers in the cinema, not to mention her young listeners and Jigan Schumacher know, is the certain death of the children remaining in the vehicle. Next, a boy, played by Shimon Redley, who is with us today, is on the verge of explaining to the other children how he rolled himself into a rug under a bed to hide during a German raid on the Polish doctor's house where he was being sheltered when he's interrupted by the creaking sound of one of the comedians on the stairs. Finally, another boy relates how, after being discovered in a bunker together with other Jews during a German roundup in the ghetto, his mother urges him to save himself. He runs to safety, dodging the German's bullets. Determined to save his mother, he finds armed youths and other bunkers who follow him and shoot at the Germans in an effort to enable the captured group of Jewish adults and children, including his mother, to escape. Instead, she dies in the ensuing melee, however, without knowing that her son has survived. The director of the children's home harbors painful memories of her own. When she retires to her room for the night, she replays in her mind the terrible death of her own child and weeps. The children's stories deeply unsettle the entertainers. This is not a house of children, asserts Jigan playing himself. It's a house of nightmares. He insists on leaving first thing in the morning. After a restless night, the entertainers, awakened by the sunlight streaming into the room, look out the window onto the courtyard and see the children playfully imitating their own performance from the previous evening. But unlike the comedians, caricatures of traditional shtetl Jews, the children put the flame out. Although Jigan and Schumacher, who spent the war in the Soviet Union, come to the children's home to entertain the children, it is the child survivors who, with their verve, vitality, and initiative, born of their struggles, restore the entertainer's faith in, to use their own words, the words of the entertainers, to restore their faith in the children's, I quote, bright future. According to Nathan Gross, the director, according to Gross's own interpretation of the final scene in Unsere Kinder, which expressed 40 years in hindsight, Jigan and Schumacher are desperate to flee the children's home as, I quote from Gross, as they fear that these children are lost causes in need of psychiatric treatment, end of quote. However, when the entertainers open the window and see the children having fun, I quote once more from Gross, it becomes clear that these children know how to laugh and that the future belongs to them, end of quote. For Gross then, the film is to a large degree about the successful resolution of trauma through art. Indeed, many contemporary critics and scholars agree with Gross's interpretation. I ask myself, are Gross and contemporary observers correct? Are trauma and its resolution through art, in this case comedy, central to unsere Kinder, there are several interesting facets to Unsere Kinder. But since the theme of our seminar is health and social welfare among Jews before and after the Holocaust, I would ask you this. Please ask yourselves as you watch the film, are trauma and its resolution through art at the center of Unsere Kinder? Is it a film about the therapeutic value of recounting painful experiences. You remember that Natalia Alexian talked about that this morning, but is the film about this subject, the therapeutic value of recounting painful experiences? Does Unsere Kinder address the traumatic effects of the Holocaust on children? 
and the potential and value of therapy to allay the children's afflictions. I have my own thoughts about these questions and I'd like to know yours. And I hope that we'll discuss this among other things uh, after the film. But since Shimon Redlich is with us, I'd also be interested to know from him how he processed his own Holocaust experience while he was acting in Unsere Kinder. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, and it's now time to watch Unsere Kinder. Shimon, would you like to say a few words now? Or would you like to say a few words after the screening of the film? Mm -hmm. Maybe after, after. Very good. So after. Paul, I'll hand the floor back to you. Thank you everyone for your attention. And I look forward to the discussion after the film. Thank you so much, Gabby. Thank you. That was a great introduction and, and, and a great way of, <clears throat> of understanding the film and, and having us ready with questions to, to, to start the discussion. Okay, so that was an amazing movie. I'm so glad I had a chance to see it again, but I want to turn the floor, floor over now to uh, Gabby Finder. And Gabby, it's all yours. Thank you. And I'm going to turn the floor over for a few minutes to uh, Professor Shimon Redlich, uh, my dear friend and colleague, whom I also consider my mentor. And Professor Redlich uh, is Professor Emeritus uh, at Ben Gurion University in Beersheba, Israel, where he taught for many years. He was the Sally Yellen Chair in Lithuanian East European Jewry at Ben Gurion University. He was the author, of, is the author of many books. His uh, own academic field uh, for many years was a Soviet Jewish history, uh, but uh, he entered a new phase of scholarship and reflecting on the Holocaust. And let me just mention those books and I'll show them quickly as part of show and tell. So Shimon wrote uh, a trilogy of books that are very interesting and very important. And I urge all of you to uh, read them if you can. One is called Together in a Part of Jejani, Poles, Jews, and Germans, 1919 to 1945. That's the first of a trilogy based on his life and memories and his interviews with others. Uh, the next book, which for our purposes is central, and that's his Life in Transit, Jews in Postwar Lodge, 1945 to 1950, because that's where the film was actually made. And there are many, um, uh, Shimon both uh, discusses in a scholarly way and in interviews with people, the making of the film that we just saw, Unsere Kinder. And finally, the third book in the trilogy is called A New Life in Israel, 1950 to 1954, when Shimon and his mother and aunt and uncle uh, left Poland in 1950 and went uh, to Israel. And I'll just say, uh, Shimon and I are also now thinking about uh, writing a book together in which I interview him and we talk about uh, his life and thoughts in general. So this is something that is uh, we're considering now. So Shimon, I would like, uh, you acted in the film and uh, you're a professor of uh, this history. Um, be very happy to hear a few words from you. I'm sure everyone in the audience would too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gaby. I'm very glad to participate in this event. Uh, I will make a few short remarks and then we'll go into the discussion. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, say that uh, I'm a child survivor, today 86 plus, and I'm lucky, but also you, the audience, that you can uh, meet a person at this age who can still, I hope, think clearly. That's one. Another point that I want to make is that uh, I was saved by two non-Jewish families, uh, by a Polish family, and by a Ukrainian family, which the facts of which are very meaningful in throughout my life and apparently had at some effect on my writing. Thirdly, that uh, I uh, speak under two heads. I'm both a survivor and also a historian, not only, but also of the Holocaust. So that's more or less what I wanted to mention.
Ah, maybe one more, one more remark. Since I watched the testimony of uh, the Holocaust survivor, Isra, El can you give me the name, Mr. Israeler, Israeler. Israeler, with some of his uh, remarks, I agreed fully. Uh, with some of his remarks, I did not, especially the Judeocentric theme that everything uh, evolves around the problem or the matters connected with Jews. My perspective is much more universal. And if people would like to ask me, I'll be glad to, to develop this theme uh, some more. Okay, thank you. These are my uh, few words. Thank, thank, Gabi, you're, um, you're, you're muted. May I ask Shimon a question to begin the discussion, though? I, I, I think that would be appropriate. Thank you very much. So, Shimon, <laughs> Shimon, I wanted to ask you, I mean, we've discussed this before, but um, it's uh, it'd be interesting for the audience, I think, to hear, or for our friends who are attending the seminar to hear. How did you process your own experiences during the Holocaust when you were that age, when you were acting in the film? Oh, very important question. Uh, my acting in the film and my real life during the Holocaust were not connected whatsoever. And it's very important to point this out. When I was prepared for my role in the film, and when I acted, and after I acted, I did not make any connection between what happened to me in the film and what happened to me in my real life. And this is a much wider subject. It has to do probably with the repression and other psychological phenomena. So the, the, the filmmaking for me, and not only for me, I know from my friends who also appear in this film, that this was pure fun, F-U-N. Please remember it. I guess it's time to be interesting now to hear reactions from our friends who are attending the seminar. Sure. So I so we have already um, some some uh, questions already. So let me let me uh, so let me let me thank the, uh, let me relay them to you. And, and by the way, thank you, Mr. Doc, Professor Redlich, for your comments. Um, okay. Question number one. Who was the targeted audience for this film and what was its purpose? And I guess there's another two questions. And a third question is, was Yiddish the language of the children's homes? <laughs> well, I'll start and then I'll let Shimon uh, correct and uh, compliment my answers. So uh, first of all, I should say it's interesting that the film was never, sh I shouldn't say that. The f it seems that to the best of our knowledge on the basis of uh, a couple of uh, testimonies or in, uh, interviews. It seems that the film was shown once to a Jewish audience, I think in a small venue in Poland, maybe in an apartment, that's unclear, or a small hall, but it was shown once. It was never shown again, probably because by the time it was ready, see, I, uh, the film was edited in 1949, so it really wasn't ready to be shown until 1949, even though it was filmed in 1948. And by that time, the communists regime was in the ascendant and uh, suppressing all forms or practically all forms of Jewish expression, institutional life. And it was probably impossible to show a film like this by the time it was ready. So it was shown, apparently it was shown once in it to a small group in Poland. And then it was smuggled out by uh, Goskind, who was the producer, not the director, but the producer of the film. And uh, it, it, it was shown a, a few times, maybe half a dozen times in New York, I want to say 1950, 51, I don't remember. And uh, the reaction was that people were Thank sobbing you. and crying, and that the reaction was quite emotional. So who was the film made for? Well, that's a good question. Was it made for a domestic audience? That maybe, 19, maybe the original intention was a domestic audience, but by the time the film was ready to be released, 
it was virtually impossible or impracticable to show it to a domestic audience. So by the time of its release, it was probably thought to be much more appropriate for a uh, foreign audience, Jews uh, in New York, Israel, and so forth. Though it, after it was shown a few times, it disappeared or vanished and was only recovered uh, at the very end of the 1980s. So actually Shimon and I have made it one of our missions in life, which is very interesting for us. I mean, we came very close this way to introduce the film uh, to various audiences. And in, um, I would say in the last 20 years, uh, Shimon and I have introduced the film in various ways to audiences in Jerusalem, Germany, uh, the United States, uh, often at academic conferences, but not only at academic conferences. As far as Yiddish goes, and Shimon can talk about this more, but I did research on this. It seems that very few children actually knew Yiddish. Most of them, they all um, had to be um, trained or prompted to learn Yiddish. Correct me if I'm wrong, Shimon, but I think that you were basically fed your lines and you memorized them more than you actually spoke natural Yiddish. Is that right? Yeah, I'll say a few words about okay, it. Excellent, thank you. So Shimon, I'll hand over the floor to you. What do you want to add? What would you like to add? Okay. I will speak mainly about the language issue. Um, first of all, my own experience. Uh, I was born in a middle-class Jewish family who had a shop merchants. And uh, my mother tongue was not Yiddish. My mother tongue was Polish. I learned proper Yiddish much later in my life. When I was a student at the Hebrew Zionist school in Lodz, I knew already Hebrew much better than Yiddish. And of course, my everyday language was Polish. So what my tutors for the role in Unzere Kinder did was to write up the whole script of my little speech there and uh, I tell about hiding in Polish letters, Yiddish words. And that's how I learned it by heart. But I was told also what the, and knew more or less what the meaning is. So that I think that somebody who doesn't know about this little secret could not easily detect that Yiddish was not my uh, natural language. As to other kids, and that's more of a historical comments, you had three kinds of kid uh, children actors. You had children like me who really survived in Poland itself under the Nazi occupation. Uh, and you had, excuse me, two kinds. And you had children who came back from the Soviet Union. And those kids knew quite well Russian. And some of them forgot Polish. Whereas I knew Polish and a tiny bit of Russian and a tiny bit of Yiddish. So it was a, a, a very mixed situation in regard to, to languages. But since Unzere Kinder was supposed to be a Yiddish speaking film, then those who knew Yiddish, no problem. Those who didn't know or knew partially were, were uh, taught and um, rehearsed to say in Yiddish what they were supposed to say. Uh, th thank you so much. I, had a, I this uh, to both of you. This 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 question about the language brings up a bigger question, which is how much of the depiction of this of Unzere Kinder is somehow. I mean, obviously, it's a story, you know, with a beginning, a middle, and the end. But how much is it true to life somehow? How how can we sense what this actual home was like from this movie? The home, I thought the moment was going, well, let me say two things about reality. As Shimon and I both agree, the film is like a collage or a mosaic. That is none of the children, like, as Shimon just said, he, his experience was very different. And yet there are stories of, we know from testimony of children who hid under beds and in rugs. Um, the same is true of the first uh, 
flashback. I mean, I've uncovered, uh, it was serendipitous, but I uncovered uh, in a memoir by a Polish Jewish educator who had heard from a child of something similar to what actually happened to a child that is being sold to uh, a German, you know, mocking the children, saying, who's going to buy this Jewish filth? And one Polish person went to get some a, coin, a few coins and did it. It wasn't that child. And, you know, that was very, it was maybe one in a million, but it, something like that happened, but not to that child. And, the, you know, the third, I mean, there were a few children who uh, uh, participated in the uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto, but... Not most of the people were in their late teens and early twenties. So you know things like they had it's this collage, it's mosaic. As far as the homes go, and this is the this is the this is the same question that I posed um, uh, to uh, our friends in the audience. Uh, that was my question. To what extent was you know I see to me. I mean, I'm not a psychologist. I'm also a historian, but I'm very interested in uh, the psychological approach of the film. And it seems to me, and I'm, maybe some people in the, uh, among our friends here are, have much more schooling in psychology than I do, but as someone who doesn't, it seems to me that the film is extremely conflicted about or amb ambivalent about uh, the psychological um, approach to the children. You have some, you know, the actors are saying they're, con they're, they're contradicting themselves all the time. Therapy is a good thing. Therapy is not a good thing. This is a great home. And this is a house of nightmares. So, I mean, I, I feel it's very hard to... Uh, um, to say coherently what the home was like, because the film itself seems to me to be in an interesting way, but so conflicted and contradictory. So there were many, what's interesting though, is that at the very least we know, as I said in my uh, opening remarks, that about one quarter of all, it seems to me from my calculations, one quarter of all the surviving Jewish children in Poland who reemerged or returned to Poland at some point or other, even if only for a few weeks, um, spent time in one of these facilities. That's true. These play the facilities. I think Shimon was even at Helenovic for a couple of weeks, sort of as a recuperation period, right, Shimon, something like that. So they were all, they spent time there. And so, yes, the homes played a uh, decisive role in the physical, emotional, uh, mental rehabilitation, uh, educational rehabilitation of the children. To what extent was this home realistic or representative of all homes? That's hard to say from the film because the film itself seems to be so conflicted. Right. No, un un understood. And, and, and I appreciate your, your answer. Um, what do you think? Can I, can I, add, can I add to this? Please. Okay. Um, um, as for... How real are the uh, stories told by the three children actors? Yeah. Uh, if we want to really check whether this or that happened, they are not so uh, realistic. However, however, uh, the script of this film was conceived and written not by one person by a consultation of a number of people. The number one person was Nathan Gross, the director, but also uh, the Jewish historian, uh, journalist, testimony uh, taker, uh, what's her name? The woman. Rachel, uh, Rachel, uh, Auerbach. Rachel Auerbach. Rachel Auerbach also was part of it. And as Gabi mentioned already, we found in a, a memoir of one of the post-war educators in Lodz, Schneer, I think was her name, yeah, from right. Kibbutz Lochamea Getaot, right. she mentions a very similar story to that of the girl which is being thrown into the lap of the old Polish peasant. But the real story was of a boy or even I think of two brothers. And, and this happened uh, and in the end, in the real, in real life, this Polish woman uh, joined these two brothers when they went to Israel which is a very interesting point for itself. So uh, it's, a, it's a mixed mixed story, I would say. 
but based on some real stories. Okay, no, thank you. Thank you. And I, I really, I really appreciate it. Um, so, uh, and I may, maybe we asked this, asked this already. So I, I apologize if we did, but what do you think? So you mentioned Natan Gross and you mentioned Rachel Auerbach. What do you think they were trying to get at? What, what, I didn't hear the last word. What, 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 what was the rationale? What were they? Their objective, their goal, right? Ah, the, what was the rationale? The rationale was to create uh, some kind of uh, testimony of children during and after the Holocaust. That, that was, uh, and uh, maybe, I'm not sure, but maybe there was some element also since the JDC, the joint, I think, also partially financed this, this film, that it was meant for uh, Jewish audiences, Yiddish understanding audiences in the United States. Uh, to make them acquainted with what happened during the Holocaust and maybe also for fundraising purposes. This is also a possibility. That makes sense. I would, go, I, would go, um, I would just, if I could just say something, I would just go a little bit farther. It um, seems Gab, to Gab, Gabby, just let me interrupt you for a second. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's three o'clock now. So I just, if, it's just with your permission, if we could go a few minutes over, I hope that that's okay with everybody and that you can stay with us. Okay, I don't see any objections. So we'll do that a few more minutes and then we'll have a wrap up afterwards. Okay, well, thank you thank everyone you. for staying so long. Thank you for listening. So I um, think that uh, I agree with Shimon. I would go one step farther. It seems to me that uh, Nathan Gross and Rachel Auerbach and uh, other, Giga and Schumacher and the others, uh, I argue that they wanted to create a stereotype, an image, a representation of the Jewish child the Jewish child who represented the survival of the Jewish people and on which the Jewish people in the future would base itself, its reconstruction. And this child was resilient, um, fast thinking fast. I'm also, I think it's a bit uh, gendered. Now this is a, you know, it's, um, the boys are heroic and the girl sort of uh, is passive in the three flashbacks. But the idea of a, a resilient uh, Jewish child with grit, who through his own grit, resilience, courage, survived. I think that's, and that's the kind of staircase. That child was important for the reconstruction of a Jewish future. That is a future, both in Poland and in Israel. That is uh, the Jewish community, um, the future always rests on children, but how could the Jewish future rest on children who were broken heart or who were broken in spirit? So you no, know, it's interesting for me. This is you know, um, the question to come back to the earlier question. I'm not Shimon was there, so this is you know I'm talking from what seems logical to me. There had to be in the homes, also as Natalia was saying today, there had to be some children with at least what I would call, uh, in a euphemistic way, adjustment problems. You don't see those children in this film. That's you don't see children. I mean, they existed in those homes but you don't see them in this film. This film is not about those children. Those children have room or a place in this film. This is a film about child Holocaust survivors who uh, with unbroken spirit and unbroken bodies represent the Jewish future. That's how I see it. Now that's the, uh, it's, it's the poetic license of the directors. This is, the kind, this is their objective. They have an ideological objective and that's it. No, oh, thank you so much. That I mean, that makes that make that makes that makes a lot a lot of sense. Um, just another question or two. Um, uh, okay. Um, so one question is about the partisan or lead the the partisan song, and uh, uh, our, the teacher wants to know where does the melody come from. Maybe you could just say a word or two about that. Well, it was written by Hirsch Glick. Uh, who was from Vilna. Now, I'm not a music expert, but I do know that the version, as far as I understand, and uh, this is maybe somebody in the audience who, um, one of our friends in the audience. Uh, I, I will have something to say about it. I think that this is an extended version of the usual version that we hear. Um, so, um, yeah, it's the partisan song that was written by Hirschquick once again. It's this idea that children are singing a partisan song that is, they are walking into the future and they represent uh, the uh, unbreakable Jewish spirit. All right, Shimon, what do you want to add to that? 
uh, one thing is that uh, the words were changed. We don't have time to go into it, but it is also going along the lines of a bright future and the happiness in the future and so forth. Second, and this has to do also with Polish communist censorship, even in, in 1948. You hear in this film the uh, soundtrack of a choir singing most of these songs. In the film credits never appeared any credit for the choir. Why? because this was our choir and my choir, because I was in that choir. This was the choir of the Zionist, Hebrew Zionist school named after the uh, uh, heroes of the Warsaw Jewish ghetto uprising, Lochamea Getaot. Beit HaSefer HaIvri Al Shem Lochamei HaGetaot. And uh, that's, that's it. So I, I have one other, one other question. And um, I think it, it um, goes back to your, the question about the art and you know, the, the therapeutic, uh, therapeutic aspects of art that you asked in the very beginning. But so, so one of the teachers asked, why should we use, why did they use fictional accounts? Why not use accounts that were 100% true? Well, it's not a documentary, it's a feature film. And it's a feature film with an objective. And uh, it's, uh, I use this term in a neutral way as a historian without any value judgment, but it's about myth-making you know, making, uh, creating a representation or an image of the Jewish child. And if it were based on reality, it would be much more complex. Uh, this is, and this, it's rather, I mean, it's interesting for what, I think it's extremely interesting that you have Jews uh, with survivors of the Holocaust, adults, who are um, thinking about the Jewish future and they feel the need to create a heroic image or a resilient image of the Jewish child. If it were based on reality, it would be much more complicated. That's, that wasn't their objective. I mean, I'm not a filmmaker, but most, film, most feature films have, they have an objective, they have a motive, they want to say something. This is what Nathan Gross wanted to say. That's, so it, that's, was maybe, it was maybe too close to the events themselves, to the Holocaust, to really go into real details. This would come in later years and up to this very day when we get more and more complex situations. Remember, when I, remember in my, if I could just say one last thing, you'll remember when I was quoting from a, a meeting of uh, the uh, directors of schools of the Jewish um, homes uh, for the children, children's homes in 1947. They were talking about children who could barely function, children who didn't know what, it, who were afraid to be touched, children who couldn't cry, right? Those children also, there were children who were well adapted in the homes, but there were also children who were not well adapted. We don't see the children who are not well adapted. If it were a realistic depiction of the home, you would see both kinds of children. You don't, right. because right. they wanted to create a certain image. So th that so two more questions and then we should probably wrap it up. Although <laughs> we could probably ask a lot more questions. It's very um, simple yeah. question: Which one was uh, Gigan and which one was Schumacher? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Schumacher is the one with the glasses, with the round okay. face. Gigan okay. is a more angular uh, person. Okay, that's By okay. We should also say they had a they had a career in Israel afterwards too. Yeah, in the 1960s. Yeah, they split though pretty, they split. Actually, Schumacher died pretty early, 61, and Gigan, if I remember And before that, that, they split. And yeah. before yeah. his before death, they yeah. split. Yeah. And and so I guess one other question. Well, I, and, and actually what, the, what Mr. Redlish said sort of brings this up. How much pandering was there? How much looking over the shoulder to the communists were there? For example, they mentioned how this Jewish farmer they don't mention, but there's a scene of the Jewish farmer taking them partway to the home. So how does this film deal with that? Or how is this, how does this reflect it in the film? It's, uh, can I say something? Yeah, please. 
the film was produced in an interim period mm -hmm. uh, when communism was not yet completely entrenched in Poland, when there was still some leeway, but communism was already there. So you have all kinds of elements which in 1947, even 48, could be shown to the public, but in 49, 50 and on could not be shown to the public. And so you have a kind of a mixture of things there. I also want to say, and, uh, Shimon could correct me if I'm wrong, there were some Jews who believed uh, in build, rebuilding Jewish life in Poland. Of course, the yes. communist Jews who were there. That's right. You, so can, you, you this... cannot deny it. No. You okay. cannot deny that uh, quite a number of Jews were pre-war communists or joined the communist movement, and some post-war po uh, Holocaust, post Holocaust Jews in Poland made very nice careers until anti-communist anti-Semitism appeared on the scene. So it, it's all uh, mixed and complicated. There is no black and white. No, no. That makes well, it interesting. It does make it interesting and complicated. The story, the history is complicated, the, the homes, but the, it's so wonderful to, um, you know, to, uh, oh, have one, I have one other question about using this and then, then we should really wrap up. Um, uh, if we were to use this uh, film with American students, uh, maybe in a Hebrew school or, or a Jewish school, what age do you think would be appropriate? Maybe young teenagers, 13, 14, 15, something like that. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I love this film, but again, it's not a documentary. And I think uh, I've been a teacher for many years. You, when you just, you have to you watch it and then you have to discuss it, but I think you have to discuss it with all of its uh, gray areas, right? I think it would be more interesting. Our kids are so, astute nowadays. I mean, they can, they see where there's a bit of image making or myth making. I say that again in a neutral sense. So I think it would be very interesting to discuss with kids who are 14, 15, 16, but then to discuss it in an honest way. You say, this is not a black and white film. Life after the Holocaust was not black and white. Jews were, um, had various views. They belonged to various political groupings. And this film represents that uh, complexity. That's, a, and then I think it would be very, you could have with, uh, uh, kids 15, 16, very interesting discussions about that. What do you think, yeah. Shimon? Shimon, what do you think? I think you're right. But <laughs> it won't, it's not so easy for a teacher to explain all the complexities because there were many. But just to choose certain themes, how they appear and discuss uh, whether this is correct or, or this was image making and the problem of languages and the problem of a very fast change in life because youngsters came to a school and left very fast. That's in uh, Jewish life in post-war Poland, not only in Lodge, was life in transit. And one can use this concept also to, to explain some of the phenomena in the film. Yeah. If I could add one last thing, because as Paul mentioned earlier in his very nice introduction for me, I, I edited a book that was published last year called Laughter After, Humor in the Holocaust. And it's about uh, the ways in which, you, primarily about humor after the Holocaust, mostly by Jews to try to process and understand the Holocaust. So what... Humor is part of human, that makes us human humor. Animals don't laugh, humans laugh. And I think that uh, that might be a very interesting thing for uh, uh, teenagers to discuss. How can one, I mean, the Holocaust was so tragic and there's, uh, it's so dark and yet you have Jews who try to process it. I mean, this is a, in many ways, it's a funny film. Not totally funny, but it's a funny film. Uh, has funny moments. How was humor used already so shortly after the Holocaust to try to make sense, either successfully or unsuccessfully, what happened? I think that would be very interesting uh, for young people. 
No, thank you so much. I think that was really it's a wonderful discussion, and and um, we could probably go on and on, but I do want to let the yes, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for your patience and listening to us. I know the Shimon and I um, uh, got a lot out of it, but I want to thank everyone in uh, the audience for uh, bearing with us. I think we did as well. I